Good evening, everyone. Just want to start off by thanking Helen for organising this event and to the other presenters for their time, as well as everyone else who took the time out of their day to attend. My name is Wade and I'm a Warramai man, an Indigenous ranger at Tide. Tide is an Indigenous not-for-profit organisation with rangers in Taree, Foster, Karua and Gloucester. These rangers perform environmental management contracts for and alongside agencies such as National Parks and Wildlife Services, Council, Local Land Services, etc. And I'm just going to highlight some of these environmental management projects that I've been involved in within the last year that I've started. Uh, the bulk of the ranger contracts are weed removal around the mid coast area. Uh, the largest and most challenging of these contracts would be the removal of Ludwigia longifolia in Darrowink Nature Reserve. Native to South America, Ludwigia longifolia was found in the reserve post 2019 2020 fires, as it was some of the first vegetation regrowing. The challenge was not only the limited access to the site, but the species itself. I do have a picture down in the bottom left corner, which kind of shows the access. You know, fallen tree over a, a pond to try and get to the uh, Luigia. It's an aquatic shrub growing in still or slow moving water. In the reserve, a good portion is quite swampy or underwater, so it's prime habitat. Uh, tr treatment consisted of spraying chemical on heavy, heavily infested areas, hand removing of seed pods, and then the plant itself. The seeds are located inside pods along the stem and are released once the pod dries out and breaks. Each pod contains thousands of pepper grain sized seeds, which have up to about a 97% successful germination rate. That's seeding every four to six weeks in the warmer months, the careful removal of these pods before they break is essential to controlling the species. Hand removing of the plants include removing of the majority of the muddy soil, because if there's actually too much of the soil left on the roots, too many nutrients, it'll continue to regrow. And um, even uh, parts of the stem that might break off are actually able to reshoot as well if they fall into the soil. So it, um, yeah, essential task as well. Uh, the top left-hand corner, uh, that's the um, one of the, largest infestations of Ludwigia longifolia we have. All that um, ready sort of orangey you see, that's all Ludwigia. Like I said, thousands of seeds per seed pod, 97% successful germination rate. It's pretty bad. Down the bottom left-hand corner, at the, um, the base of the base of the water where you can see it kind of built up a bit, that's just how much um, that muddy soil does actually stay onto the roots and like I said we need to get rid of that to actually be able to um, yeah control it and then the uh, the big picture we got on the right right in the center is a um, is a picture of one of the Libigia longifolia and it's not the greatest picture sorry but there is um if you look up towards the top end of the picture you'll see a, um, a seed pod that looks really quite dry and scraggly. So that's getting pretty close to um, the busting out and releasing all those peppery sized grains. So like I said, the, uh, the first and foremost thing that we do is any of those pods we have to carefully remove. And uh, you know, in case of it spilling out, spilling out and then creating a further problem for us down the track. A uh, bit more about the um, uh, limited access, uh, once again, Ludwigia across the pond. And on the right-hand side, it's actually National Park's helicopter that's um, uh, dropping in some water or getting ready to drop in some water due to the, um, the vast infestation, like in that picture just in the previous slide, means we needed quite a lot of water for the, the chemical mixing. And the access to the site being so limited, this is actually at the back of somebody's property, means that, yeah, national parks had to come and give us a hand and um, move, the, um, move the water inside for us. Some other environmental projects we've been a part of is debris cleanup, 
of um, beaches, rivers, creeks in order to try and you know, protect our, our coast and our waterways. Occasionally, we've assisted uh, in the protection of shorebirds through um, baiting programs for feral animals or trapping, as well as helping silos building some of the fences out there at Farquhar. Indigenous artifacts, uh, protection and collection conducted when construction starts in parks or state forests. And I've got a picture off to the, um, the right hand side. Just a couple of weeks ago, we we're out at Saltwater National Park and um, that was believed to be an axe head, um, as well as vegetation planning to assist in erosion control. Uh, the picture right in the middle, that's um, some remnants of a trolley we found in Browns Creek here in Taree during a um, clean up just about a week ago. The next biggest project and easily my favourite is the Ab Aboriginal Bushfire Recovery Rangers or ABRR. This project was established after the 2019-2020 fires with the aim of assisting country to heal and monitor the results. The project includes post-fire weed management, which was completed at Darawank, what I was just talking about. 500 nest boxes to be placed out to replace hollows that were destroyed in the fires, as well as two rounds of trail cameras to confirm and monitor fauna activity. The funding for the project was secured from the Australian government Round one being funded by the Department of Agriculture, Water and Resources and the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources for round two. The project encompasses collaborations with government agencies, independent ecological contractors and a steering committee to ensure the highest level of success. And a variety of data is incorporated in order to investigate the presence and sometimes abundance of fauna activity on site. Data collected from the trail cameras, like you see off to your right there, of a um, redneck wallaby, uh, generally provide the best evidence of fauna presence, obviously, but scats, tracks, and other signs left by animals are also used and observed. Generally, it's these indicators that help us um, in the positioning of the cameras out there in the field you know, in order to get the, the best result. Now I've got a few more pictures here. The, um, the top left, we've, uh, it's a bit blurry, but we've got a koala. We're actually pretty lucky to get that one you know, coming down onto, oh, not the ground necessarily on a log, but coming down, having a sniff of our, um, our bait station we've got there, which is a nice muesli mix. So nothing that the koala would normally eat. So like I said, pretty, pretty lucky. Just came down to investigate off to the, right of that scrub turkey then down in the bottom right we've got a yeah, dingo or wild dog whatever you want to call it and like i was saying about the um the markings tracks scats in order to help position the cameras the bottom left is a um a tree with scratchings all over it the scratchings went all around the diameter of the tree so we decided to place a camera pretty close by and that one was in kaiwarik state forest and don't have a picture here because it wasn't as good as the rest of them but um yeah we did end up getting a couple of goannas so yeah it's always good yep. historically the traditional owner of this land would perform cultural burns at specific times of the year in order to manage the land these burns were a lot different to the wildfires and hazard reduction burns we're now used to Slow and cool burns with lighter and whiter smoke would be introduced at the right time of the year to ensure the healthiest land possible. The timing of the burn is different per country type, per vegetation, per um, parent trees, so your canopy trees, um, and a complex array of indicators that are intertwined um, to do with the land, and you know, it all kind of connects back to each other and they're what's actually used in order to determine when it's actually the, the right time. Like for example, you wouldn't want to put a burn into an area with uh, when your bush tucker is you know, in prime eating stage. But on the flip side, putting a burn into um, an area with fire dependent species means that you're going to receive the, the most healthiest seed, uh, seed production possible. 
the benefits of these burns are unavoidable. Cooler fire means the seed bank in the soil does not get destroyed and the canopy remains untouched. The destruction and prevention of invasive vegetation is another bonus. By burning at the right time, you ensure that only the rightful inhabitants can live there. This is due to the native seed bank being given a chance to shoot first and display others, and also actually killing um, anything that doesn't belong there. And I'll get to that towards the end. Now, unfortunately, cultural burning isn't the norm anymore. However, since the 2019, 2020 bushfires has been a push to bring back the traditional way of managing land. At working with Tide, the rangers have been fortunate enough to witness a number of these cultural burns as a part of our training to become cultural burning practitioners. So we can actually go out and do this, um, you know, in the future in our local area. And the results of these burns honestly speak for themselves. And I've got a couple of pictures. So this is the um, you know, same sort of area, like the, the tree that you see to the left in the, the right photo is the one you see in the center of the left. And I just think it shows how well it works because as you can see, there's still grass towards the edge, but it's not burnt. That grass was not ready to burn. So the fire went out before it reached that grass, protecting the trees, protecting the canopy, avoiding those you know, large flare ups, big fires. So I, like I said, I think it's quite amazing. We've got a few more. Uh, the one on the left is a native grass that had fire literally pass through it and you can, you know, see that the black around it, but as you can see, it's not burnt to a crisp, it's still green shoots shooting through. Top right hand corner is some tea tree, same story, uh, where the fire literally passed right over the top of it and as you can see, it, it barely looks burnt, barely looks touched. And the bottom right hand corner, I think it's just an absolutely amazing photo. Just that beautiful white smoke, just very, very spiritual, very beautiful. Uh, like I said about, um, you know, killing anything that may not be there. So weeds or, you know, even native species that aren't meant to be in the area they are. At one of these burns, I actually saw lantana, probably about, you know, six foot sort of tall. The flames went no more than about you know, a couple of feet up the, um, the stem of the lantana. The lantana didn't catch fire, but within about two hours, the leaves had shriveled up and it was dead. So like I said, I think it's just pretty incredible way to manage the land and just, you know, you don't need your fire breaks and, and everything like that, because as long as you manage the country the way that it's meant to be, the fire will go out before it gets to an area that's not ready to burn. Now, working on country as part of these projects has been a very rewarding time. It has left me feeling more connected to my culture. I didn't grow up on the coast, unfortunately, but in Sydney, away from the beaches, I have always had a passion for the water and our marine life. Being a warrior, my man now living on the coast, I feel a lot more culturally and spiritually connected. And that's about me. So I want to thank everyone for listening and um, yeah, good luck to the rest of the presenters. Fantastic. Thank you, Wade. That was wonderful. It's so interesting that um, those cultural burns and the difference that they make and, and you can really see from your photos um, the different effects, you know, like it's incredible that plants can have the fire literally go straight through them and leave them intact and are still alive. It's really awesome to see. Incredible. Yeah.